the format for today is, is we're going to have our speakers, we have a number of speakers on the call now who will be giving short presentations. They're not going to be super lengthy. The idea is just to give a brief overview of each of their areas. Um, this will just sort of be an introductory Zoom call. So a, just a brief overview of what NPS is all about, the, the various aspects of it. And then we will go through um, and each of the speakers will give it about five to 10 minutes to talk. So it's not going to be super long. After that, we'll do a Q and A. Um, many of you have submitted questions in the past and I have those, you know, on my handy dandy sheet here. And we will go through those, um, you know, asking the various speakers for their participation on those. Um, all of the people who are attending um, will be muted for the whole course of the, the, the event. And the idea is just to not make this unruly because there's just so many people. Um, if you have any additional questions um, that, you know, a burning question or you need a follow up or something, you can put it in the chat. No, no guarantee that the um, that we'll be able to address all the questions in the chat because there's a lot. Um, who's 022805? Okay, we figured it out. Um, if you put a question in the chat, we will try our best to to um, deal with them, but we may not be able to. So please understand that we're we're trying our best here in in a new environment. Um, don't uh, so just use the chat if you need to ask questions or anything like that. Um, James Bray is on this call as well. He's the, 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 the guy who's been helping me out getting this all set up. And he's kind of working in the background with any issues. So he will, um, if you have any technical issues or what have you, you can let him know and we can work through that. Um, this meeting is being recorded um, and it will be posted later on to YouTube. There's a way you can convert these things to YouTube. And then we will post them on the Facebook pages for those folks who weren't able to attend today. So that way, um, uh, that way everybody can benefit from it later on. And if there's something you want to listen to again, you can go back and see it again. So the, 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 um, the plan for, for the future is, is, you know, today we're doing this call. This is just sort of a brief overview. And our plan is, is that on future months, perhaps on the third Saturday of the month, if that seems to work well, um, we will host other Zoom events where we'll just focus more on different aspects of NPS. So maybe we'll have one Saturday where we'll talk about kidneys, one Saturday we'll talk about the eyes, one Saturday we'll make it a, more of an open format and we can all discuss our knee issues or whatever the case may be. And hopefully that way we can get more people involved. We can all, all learn a little bit from one another and it can kind of be a little bit more of an extension of the, um, of the Facebook pages and make it a little bit more interactive. So, um, and I'd love to other people's feedback on, on what we can do to make this better as well, because I think um, I think there's so many things we can do now with technology. We might as well just, you know, take advantage of it. So I want to start out by introducing the speakers who are on the call today. And I, I would ask speakers that when I um, when I mention your name, if you could just unmute yourself and say a quick hello. That way everybody can see your face and know who you are. <laughs> um, um, and, and I want to, first of all, just give my, my heartfelt thanks to all of them for being willing to do this. You know, these are all very busy ladies and gentlemen. They, they all have very, very full-time jobs with lots going on and they volunteer their time so readily for us, um, and are just such a, such a gift to all of us. And we really do appreciate that. So our first speaker, and I'm just going to introduce all the speakers first, and then we'll, we'll start into the presentation. So our first speaker today will be Dr. McIntosh. And I think everybody knows Ian from previous conferences, from all of the work that he's done in genetics. Um, and I think when any of us learned about NPS the first time, we all just had to first learn how to spell Ian to actually search his name because we all <laughs> spelled it incorrectly. But um, Ian has always been just such a godsend to us all. And, and Ian, please say hello. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Liz please acknowledge that you can actually hear me just because it's the first time I've had Zoom run on this computer. Um, so yeah, uh, great to see that so many people are able to join in and um, I'll be back in a minute. Wonderful. Thank you, Ian. And next on the call, we have um, Dr. Towers. Now I haven't actually seen her on here, so I hope she's actually here. I'm here. Um, oh, wonderful. Thank you. So 
Dr. Towers has also been very involved with all of us from, from the beginning of, of when we started these conferences way back in the day. Um, Adele happens to have a son with NPS as well, so she's not only an MD expert, but she's also a, a mom expert in this world, and I think many of us have to deal with that as well. But uh, please say hello, uh, Adele, to everybody. Yes, hello to all my old friends and, and hello to all my new friends out there. My name is Adele Towers. <clears throat> I'm from the University of Pittsburgh. And as Joanne mentioned, I also have a son who has nail patella. So I look forward to talking with you all and hearing more about your questions and concerns. Thank you. Thank you. So the next speaker was supposed to be Dr. Zaretsky. And I don't think he's on the call unless I've missed, his, if I've missed him. But I'll just say something about Dr. Zaretsky. Some of you may have heard me say this earlier. Um, Dr. Zaretsky um, is an orthopedic surgeon. He also has a son with NPS. Um, his son uh, had a number of, of, of tra organ transplants a couple of years ago and got a new pancreas very recently and unfortunately is having some complications. So they were in the ER with him earlier this week. So um, th there, was, there was some likelihood that he wasn't going to be able to make it today. So it appears that he hasn't been able to make it. And for those of you who know Dr. Zaretsky, just as an added thing, you, you may have heard that his, his wife passed away last year from cancer. Um, uh, so something to keep in mind when you do get an opportunity to see him. You know, we all knew and loved Jane and, um, you know, it's definitely a, a, a tough thing for their family to have to go through. Um, our next speaker is um, Sam Mansour, happens to be my husband. Um, uh, he's an that's, <laughs> that's my only claim to fame and we can move on. <laughs> Your greatest um, achievement, Sam. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Despite Sam, Sam is an ophthalmologist and will be speaking to us about the eye issues, um, uh, some of the eye issues associated with NPS. So we, uh, we look forward to that. Delighted. And next on our list is Dr. Lemley. Uh, Dr. Lemley is a nephrologist from um, UCLA. He's a pediatric nephrologist. So he deals with, like, I did that right? No, I, you're, you're making a face. Okay, he's going to correct me. Anyways, he's a kidney specialist. So he's the guy who, you know, he's that guy. Go ahead, Kevin. <laughs> correct me. I'm from that other institution in LA oh, called the University of Southern me. California. Uh, my uh, bad, my bad. Good university. <laughs> yeah. okay. Children's Hospital. Oh. All right, there's no, no issues there at all, I'm sure. <laughs> Not the first time it's happened, Joanne. Not this season, you won't be playing. <laughs> there you go. All right, and then our last speaker of the day will be Dr. Susan Guzman, who I did see on the call earlier. I don't see her face on my screen right now, but she's here. Susan is a, um, is a clinical psychologist, and um, she can tell you a little bit more when she comes on about what she does, but she herself has NPS, and she also has a son with NPS, and um, really has been an incredible resource for us in helping to deal with some of the emotional aspects of uh, having a chronic disease and having male patella syndrome. So um, Susan, if you could say hello. Hello, really, this is so fun. I really, uh, I've missed everyone and it's so nice to see the new faces. Uh, looking forward to, to having more time with all of you in further breakout sessions. Wonderful, yeah, Susan has so graciously offered to do some breakout sessions with different groups later on. She did this marvelously at previous conferences for those of you who were able to attend a conference um, in the past and you're gonna find her, you know, the, what, what she can offer to you really in, incredibly helpful. All right, so enough of that. So what we're going to do then is if everybody could make sure their they're, they're calls are muted again, we're gonna have Ian uh, start out with his presentation and um, Ian, then why don't you go ahead and when, you're, um, when he's through, then we'll, you know, we'll segue into the next one. Okay, someone needs to let me share my screen. I think you, I there should be a, it, it, uh, Ian, I think there should be a button at the bottom of your screen that says share screen. Yeah, it says host disabled attendees ah, screen sharing. All right, I apologize. Let me go in and fix that one moment. It's all good practice for us to figure out Zoom this way. You see, it's uh... <laughs> okay. Allow participants to share screen. Perfect. Can you try that now, please? Oh, 
God, I didn't know, I didn't know so many things open. <laughs> uh, what do I want? I want that one. All right, Sam, Sam just mentioned to me that Maddie's on. Maddie Zarevsky, welcome. Good to see you here. Um, we heard that you were you were under the weather, so I'm happy to see that you're well enough to join us. We're waiting yeah, for Ian I'm to figure out his screen. I'm not seeing share my screen. Curses. So at the very bottom of your monitor, there should be a, a green button that says. Yeah, I've screen. pressed that. It's telling me to do something in preferences, and I can't find where Zoom wants me to. So if you want, Ian, if you want to email it to me quickly, I can share it on my screen if you want. I just too big a file to email. Oh, okay. I can, or I can start and then he can figure it out. And yeah, right. Just, we, okay, yeah, thanks. Minutes. Thanks, um, Adele. Do you okay. want me to pull yours up, Adele, or do you want to sure. pull it up yourself? You can pull it up. All right. I right, just have on. a very brief presentation. <laughs> All right, so go ahead, Adele. You get started. I'll pull it up in just a quick second as I... Give me a quick second. Well, once here, again, everybody. everyone, thank you for. I'll actually switch computers and then. No, okay. Yeah, you all want to hear them, to be honest with you. I'm a primary <laughs> care provider, <laughs> but I'm just here to tell you that I've had the opportunity now over these past 20 some odd years of, of working with at least maybe 12 to 15 patients uh, who have nail patella syndrome. So it's something that, you know, I feel very comfortable talking to people about and understanding what their questions are and their concerns and things that we see. Joanne, if you can't share the screen, I'll do it. Yeah, I'm just pulling it up here. It's gonna take me a second. I got it. Okay. Do you have it? See it? Can you nope. see it? Here we go. As long as you can see it, uh, I'll put it in presentation mode and see if you can yep. see it that way. Perfect. Okay. So again, my focus for you is really to be your advocate or your quarterback, you might say and what you need to do for your own primary care. And, and the message that I have for everyone when they come in, because I've, I've had some of my patients who say to me, you know, they just found out in their 20s that they have nail patella and, and it's, a, it's frightening. And, and the message that I give to everyone is you can live a long and healthy life, even with nail patella. So it's not like it's going to cause any major problems in, in most people. And I know there are some people who are on the line that have had some chronic issues, but we can certainly try to prevent many of the problems. And I, and I do have one patient who actually has also gone to transplant as well. So the key for us is to monitor all these issues. And this is really basic primary care, uh, monitor for high blood pressure, osteoporosis, depression, and Susan's going to be talking about that. Kevin Lemley will be talking about renal testing. <laughs> Sam's going to be talking about eye testing and glaucoma as well. And the other things that I see a lot of are bowel issues and joint pain. So these are really very basic. And, the, and the, the message is really the good advice is to get the regular medical checkups, get a healthy diet, exercise, and consider some supplements. And when, when we have a longer time to talk, I will go through all of that. But the big summary for you is what you can do is to be an advocate for your own health because most primary care providers, I was just in the emergency room last night with my son and he said, do you have any medical problems? And my son goes, I have nail patella. And he, and he looks at me and he goes, what is that? Um, and that's what most um, physicians will say. And they don't know the impact of that on your health. So if your doctor doesn't offer to be proactive about some of these issues and you have to ask. And, and really it does boil down to the foundation, which is to eat right, take certain supplements, maybe like vitamin D, exercise, because that's very critical for your muscle and joint health. And we can talk about that. And the biggest thing that I see is many of us smoke cigarettes and that really increases the inflammation. Uh, drink only in moderation and then also get your yearly exams. And again, uh, test even if you don't feel well, you know, even if you do feel well, just get your test done. So the, uh, the one other thing I wanted to share is that the, the other, my other colleagues, they all have expertise in very specific fields. 
The only thing that I can actually lay claim to is that we did a study about osteoporosis and fractures in people with nail patella. We did that at our conference in 2002, which was 18 years ago. So it's hard for me to believe. Uh, and I don't see any other new data since that time. But there, was, there were some questions earlier that said, uh, is there an issue with osteoporosis? The one thing we actually saw was that there was definitely an issue with increased fractures. So, but we can talk more about that when I get more time. And I just wanna thank everyone for, for letting me speak. And if you need to speak with me, uh, here's my email address. I may not get back to you right away, but I'll do my best to get back to you if you have any questions or uh, if you want any guidance as to how to talk to your provider, let me know, okay? And that's all I have, Joanne. Wonderful, thank you, Adele. I appreciate that. I appreciate um, just getting started with that. Ian, have you got yourself sorted out? Where did Ian go? I don't see him on my, oh, maybe he's not back on yet. Um, Sam, you might be pinch hitting. Sorry, he's no, getting I'm a drink okay. from the fridge. Oh, Ian's back, very good. Yeah, all right, just, so, happy. all right, excellent, there you are. All right, we'll pass it over to Ian then and let him uh, start his bit. Thank you. Okay, let me see. Share screen. Something there. And I just want to say that none of us look any older. I'm really impressed. Yeah, that was very good. <laughs> Our last conference was 2010, wasn't it, Joanne? Yeah. You know, I don't remember. No, it wasn't 2010. I think there was, it's more recent than 10 years ago. Oh, but right. I don't, re I don't remember how recent it was, though, to be perfectly honest. I, I, okay. I I'm not at home at the moment, so I can't look it up. <laughs> Is my screen showing? Not yet. Not at the moment, no. 2013, someone said in the chat. Yeah. Oh, it, it briefly just said iPad. Your camera went off. Um, something. Start video. We see you now, so that's a start. You see me, yeah. I've just got to get my screen to show. There we go. That should do something. Yeah, this it? looks like it's doing it. It's taken a second. There we go. There we there go. go. Yay. 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 Yay for technology. Okay. Yes, I think this might be the first time I've actually presented on Zoom, so normally I just chat on it. Um, okay, so I'll be talking a bit about the NPS gene, which is LMX1B. Um, most of the work that I'll be talking about was done by somebody, by other people around the world. Um, the stuff that was done in my lab many years ago, um, that's when I was at, uh, oh, what happened, Johns Hopkins, there we go. Um, and then I subsequently taught med students for a while. So my email's there if anyone needs to reach me with questions about the gene. Oh, which no one advance. Great. Let Sam go ahead while I fix the figure this out, please. Sam, are you good? Yeah. You have to uh, unmute yourself then. Oh, there you go. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, I have to wait till somebody unshares. Okay, so let me try it again. Here we are. And let's see. Let's go up here. And let me, can everyone see my, my screen? We can. Okay. You just have to can, start the slideshow. This will be very brief. There's only 120 slides that we'll review. And there will be a quiz <laughs> Sorry, Seriously, you said there were 65 last night. I no, told him he wasn't like allowed to do that many. Well, I'm, I'm very proud and honored to uh, be speaking to everyone today. And uh, as Jermaine mentioned, uh, this is a very truncated version of the presentation that we usually give. So hopefully it'll allow you to have more um, uh, Q&A time. Uh, so I am um, actually an ophthalmologist uh, who is, in uh, addition to being in private practice, also uh, have an academic affiliation with George Washington University, and my area of uh, specialty is vitreoretinal surgery, uh, but we end up managing and dealing with a lot of glaucoma, so I will be uh, presenting that particularly today. So uh, just a quick 
uh, explanation diagram of the eye, human eye. I, I, some of you are familiar with these things. Um, this is a cross section area. Keep, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, uh, focus on the optic nerve. You can see my mouse moving on the screen. Yeah, okay. And the anterior portion. So if you imagine the eyeball like a, a the earth, there's an equator, which is the greatest diameter, and there's the posterior segment, anterior segment. So in NPS, we're going to be addressing actually uh, issues that affect both anterior and posterior segment. Um, so this is a uh, cross-sectional area of the front part of the eye. You can see the cornea here. And this is the iris, the colored part. And behind it is the lens, which in all of us will become a cataract. The key thing to remember in this diagram is that you see this meshwork. There's uh, a water pressure that your eye and uh, my eye has to keep inflated, just like a soccer ball, except instead of air, it's water. These structures here that look like udders called the ciliary body, drop a uh, drop of clear water into the back of the eye every few seconds. It circulates in the back of the eye, goes through the pupil, and drains at these grates called the meshwork. And if you have a blockage of this meshwork, the pressure rises in the eye, and it starts to cause some problem. Here's an illustration of what we call aqueous, or the water flow. Uh, that is generated by the ciliary body goes again through the pupil and out this meshwork. So this is important to keep in mind when we talk about management of this condition. When you or I go to uh, have our eyes examined and uh, the doctor picks up uh, her ophthalmoscope and looks inside, uh, they look at the optic nerve and among the other structures. And one of the key indices to remember is that if with high pressure, as can happen in block in uh, MPS, we, there is a cupping, we call it cupping. So if you imagine the optic nerve as it enters the eye is like a donut. So if you divide the inner diameter of the donut by the outer one, and if it's more than a two to one ratio, then that's one strike. Doesn't mean you have glaucoma, but that is suspicious for it. So what are the ocular findings in MPS? I'm not gonna go through this uh, list as we have in the past. The most important thing is the glaucoma because that is the one issue that can obviously permanently affect vision. This is a cross section of that optic, of a normal optic nerve. It's stained, this is from a pathology specimen as it comes into the eye. So this, this kind of bluish purple structure is the actual nerve. The, the very dark blue is the white part or the sclera of the eye. Now that is normal, okay? Now look at this. This is a very cupped optic nerve. This is from a different patient and different staining, but it shows what we call this invagination. And the best example I can give you folks is if you remember a beach ball, you know, the standard little cheap beach balls that have multi different colors and you blow it up. And after you blow it up, you close the valve and you pop it in so it doesn't stick out while you play with it. If the pressure is too high, you cannot put that valve back in because it pops. Why? Because that's the weakest spot in the entire wall of the balloon. So similarly, you can think of the eyeball itself as the optic nerve when it enters is the weakest area. So if you have high pressure in the eye, over time, it slowly crushes and squeezes out these one and a half million tiny little nerve fibers that are essentially the video cable connecting the eye to the brain. And here's an example of a prominent cupping. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that the patient has glaucoma, but this is prominent cupping. So if you look at, this is the right eye and this is the left eye, the right eye, the, there's the outer diameter of the optic nerve and here's the inner diameter of the optic nerve. So how does that translate practically? or uh, symptomatically in a patient. So this is, you can tell, this is not a very recent photo, <laughs> but let's just say that's the normal vision out of one eye of a patient. As glaucoma develops, they start getting tunnel vision and slowly but surely it starts to close in. So you can have patients who have 20-20 vision as they're measured in the doctor's office, yet their visual field has been almost 
uh, wiped out. Oh, you were going to look for it, that's all. So the classification for a glaucoma, uh, again, we won't go into the details. There's different types of glaucoma. Just remember, they, they divide into open angle and closed or narrow angle. And that goes back to that diagram uh, it, uh, that I showed earlier. If the meshwork is exposed and is open, or if it's narrow, where the iris, the color part, is kind of jamming or plugging it up, uh, that is a different type of glaucoma. The majority, vast majority of NPS glaucoma is the open angle type. And this is just to start to uh, illustrate uh, the work of uh, two key folks in NPS and glaucoma. And it shows on the, on the x-axis the different types of glaucoma uh, and their incidence. And these are from two studies. But you can see that primary open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. In other words, you can have situations where the pressure is high in the eye, but they don't have the full-blown uh, glaucoma. And I'll, I'll explain that in a sec. It can be just or over 40% by some of the trials. So it's not an insignificant factor in NPS. So how is glaucoma assessed? Very simple. Elevated pressure in the eye, the normal pressure is 10 to 22 millimeters mercury, but you can have people with, quote, normal pressures that still develop glaucoma. But generally speaking, an elevated eye pressure is one factor. Cupping of the optic nerve, which are reviewed, and abnormal visual fields. Okay, most of you have had this test where you put your chin in a big bowl and press a button to map out your side vision. And that's what the first areas that go in glaucoma. And loss of nerve fiber layer, again, it, that's also a more sensitive method of assessing uh, glaucoma. Now, if you only have one out of these four findings, regardless of which one, you are termed a glaucoma suspect. And some of you may have received this diagnosis where maybe your pressure is like, say, 21, 22, but everything else is normal. The, the, the optic nerve looks normal. There's no visual field deficit, and the nerve, uh, nerve fiber layer is normal. Um, and vice versa, you could have normal pressure and prominent cups and you would still be called a glaucoma suspect. And there's hundreds of millions of people in the world that are glaucoma suspects that never get glaucoma. But the key thing, as you will know, is the follow-up. And I think Adele mentioned that as well. So it's very critical that you do follow up on these things. So here's an example of a tonometer. This is one way of checking the pressure and uh, an ophthalmologist uh, does that. Uh, and then another method is using a special lens in front of the same device, the slit lamp, and examining the interior of the eye to actually look at the optic nerve in three dimensions. And obviously it's photo photographed as well for record keeping. And then visual field testing, you remember I mentioned to you, there's several devices that are able to test the side vision. And so this is an integral part of your exam uh, for ophthalmology, and it can be automated as well. And this is the type of printout. Uh, there's different ways of printing this out, of course, but this shows you um, uh, bit by bit where the visual field deficits are, and this can be tabulated for later uh, comparisons. The final thing is the OCT, optical coherence tomography. It's think of it like a CAT scan for the nerve and the retina. And uh, thankfully, these devices have been around for 15 years at least. And uh, um, actually, sorry, longer than that, uh, th almost 30 years. And they're very, very uh, sensitive at picking up changes before the other tests show abnormalities. And typically, they can image the optic nerve kind of just like the pathological specimens I showed you. So they can calculate the cup, and disc, cup to disc ratio. And also, they measure the nerve fiber layer, which this is the right and left eye of a patient and it's normal because the black line is in the green zone. So these are things that you should be getting at least annually. So in terms of follow-up, again, this is a rule of thumb for uh, NPS patients. Uh, it can be anywhere from two to four times a year to assess pressure and other things. The nerve fiber layer analysis that's done with the OCT, again, every four to two to 12 months, depending on the findings. And the visual field testing is the same, four to 12 months. 
Uh, the general management is the ophthalmologist uh, will set a target pressure and they could, let's just say, for example, they pick 16. It is then everything is done to make sure that the eye pressure does not go higher than that. And it's not an absolute value. So after a year, they could find, they could uh, repeat the test and say, okay, this, uh, we are seeing some slight loss on the visual field. Therefore, we're going to set a new target pressure, lower one, 14. And so there's several factors that the uh, clinician will use to make that assessment. Now, in terms of therapy, uh, the general approach to glaucoma in general is we start with drops, medications. And thankfully, there's a lot of effective drops uh, that are available now. And if the drops don't seem to work, the next thing is laser trabeculoplasty. If you remember that little mesh work I was, uh, showed you in the uh, anatomy slide, if the uh, grate is clogged, the drain grate is clogged, the laser can uh, start to make holes in it to allow the fluid to leave, and that's the use. Trabeculectomy and these other three are surgery, the last three, the aqueous uh, implants and the cyclodestructive procedures are really um, uh, used for tough cases that don't respond to the first two. Uh, in the case of surgical, I mentioned the laser that's done typically in the office. Other things like filtering surgery and aqueous drainage implants, they've made some significant strides, by the way, are done typically in the operating room as well as cyclodestructive procedures. Uh, some of these implants they're actually trying to have as an office-based procedure, and you can see how these small little stents that can be inserted can also control the pressure and lower the risk for glaucoma. Uh, these are just some uh, slides to illustrate the different uh, ways that can be lowered. This is to illustrate the uh, laser trabeculoplasty, and this is the area where the laser is opening the holes to allow drainage. Uh, the other techniques are to, if you can't open the drain, uh, you can turn off, turn the pump down, and by destroying selectively certain uh, portions of the pump, you can reduce the pressure. Again, this is reserved mostly for uh, more advanced glaucoma. And finally, the uh, implants, uh, there's a huge host of different types of implants that can act like reservoirs, allowing the pressure to stay permanently low. Uh, and again, these are reserved for more advanced. And that's it, folks. I will unshare my screen. So Thank that you, Sam. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. I'm proud of you. You did that in under 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I was expecting well, you to go the longer. Fact that, the fact that you held a gun to my head also facilitated that. <laughs> All right. This is a running joke. Every conference, Sam's the one who goes the longest. And, you know, I'm the one he responds to the least when I tell him to stop talking. So anyways, thank you, Sam. Um, very helpful. So our next speaker will be Dr. Lemley. Um, Dr. Lemley, I don't know if you have any slides or not. But no, I've, are... I've been uh, scared by everything that's happened before. So Wonderful. So we just get your lovely face. That's even better. You're on, sir. Okay. So as Joanne said, my name is Kevin Lemley, and I specialize in kidney diseases. Uh, and that's called a nephrologist. Urologists are the surgeons that specialize in the kidney. Nephrologists are the medical doctors. I'm in particular a pediatric nephrologist, meaning that I specialize in kids' kidneys, but I've uh, had quite a bit of experience with adults with NPS and other diseases. Uh, so the kidney is one of the vital organs that is often affected by nail patella syndrome. Generally, we think of kidneys as working like filters to clean the blood in essence, they remove waste from the blood and excrete those wastes in the urine to get them out of the body. Uh, they do that and actually do an awful lot more. So one thing they do is regulate how much salt is in the body. And by doing this, they can strongly influence blood pressure. So high blood pressure can be one of the hallmarks of many kidney diseases. And in kind of a vicious circle, high blood pressure also damages the kidneys. So when the kidneys don't work, they can even get worse from not working. Uh, Adele, of course, will know that the kidneys also affect bone health. 
because they activate vitamin D that our normal dietary D is not active and requires activation steps of which the last one the kidney does. And they prevent anemia by making the hormone that Lance Armstrong didn't use uh, that tells the bone marrow uh, to make red blood cells. So a common manifestation, kind of an easy manifestation of kidney disease in general is having protein in the urine. So the kidney filters act like little sieves and when they're healthy, they let wastes leak out into the urine because these are generally very small molecules, but they hold back the proteins that are in the blood, uh, which tend to be bigger. So a leaky filter allows some protein to appear in the urine. The filter can be leaky enough that red blood cells, which are very much bigger, also leak through the filter in some diseases. This is called hematuria. About 20 to 30 percent of nail patella patients will have mild to moderate proteinuria. So it is not a very uncommon finding. Uh, proteinuria is what we call an excessive amount of protein in the urine. About 10 to 20 percent of nail patella patients will have blood in the urine that is abnormal, but not necessarily blood that you can see. So we call it microscopic hematuria. You can test for it or see it under a microscope. More severe proteinuria in nail patella syndrome is uncommon. It's probably less than 10% of patients, but generally has more uh, serious implications for health. So this can be bad enough that you literally have what's called nephrotic syndrome, where you have a large amount of protein in the urine and fluid retention and swelling in the body and low amounts of protein in the blood. So um, the final way the kidney can show itself to be damaged is by being unable, not just leaking some things it shouldn't leak, but unable to eliminate waste from the body. Again, cleaning the blood the kidney does is generally getting waste out into the urine from the blood. The kidneys get rid of all sorts of wastes, but when doctors talk to each other about kidney function, they usually talk about the blood level of creatinine. That's something that's made constantly. It's excreted by the kidney, but if the kidneys don't work, it builds up in the blood. So a high blood creatinine level corresponds to low kidney function. High blood pressure is also a sign of kidney disease, but especially in older people, it's a common enough thing to find, even with normal kidney function, that it's not a terribly specific sign of kidney disease. It's just one that you will also see. So kidney disease in patients with nail patella syndrome can, with two siblings, say, be totally different. One person can have very, very mild findings with a little protein in the urine and normal kidney function, and another person can go into kidney failure. So it's not due to the gene mutation in nail patella syndrome, per se. Um, our hypothesis is that there is another gene mutation that affects specifically the kidney. And if it's two siblings, one of them has nail patella mutation alone, and the other has that and this other mutation, and will have the more severe uh, kidney disease. So nail patella syndrome does not typically lead to severe kidney disease, but it can. And we saw in the chat that plenty of people, and we know about Maddie, has needed um, a kidney transplant. Uh, so that does happen even though it is not common. Uh, patients who have nail patella syndrome who develop kidney failure are generally speaking considered good candidates for kidney transplantation. There is no reason they should not be considered for it. Uh, one thing you need to know is if you get a kidney transplant and you have nail patella syndrome, it does not recur in the transplant kidney. So people who say have diabetes who get a transplant are at risk for diabetes recurring in the kidney, but nail patella syndrome, that does not happen. So you may ask, I feel fine. Do I really need to be checked for kidney disease? And if so, how do I get checked? And basically the first level of check is pretty simple to do and yet is fairly sensitive. And that's a simple check of the urine. And you may have seen it in the test. You give a urine specimen, the nurse sticks a little uh, stick into the cup, flicks it off, watches it, and looks what color develops in the test strips. 
are actually a fairly good qualitative check of whether you have blood or protein in the urine in ex excess. So if your urine test is positive, say for protein, then probably your doctor is going to want to repeat that at least once because you can get protein in the urine that doesn't last, that is not from disease. But if it repeats, then they may want to do other testing, including blood tests in particular, to look at your kidney function. So nail patella syndrome is not the only disease that can cause hematuria and proteinuria, blood and protein in the urine. And therefore, one shouldn't just rush and say, okay, you've got nail patella syndrome, you have blood and urine, it's due to nail patella syndrome. You have to be careful to make sure you've excluded any other disease. Um, in terms of when you should start doing that, small children are very rarely uh, badly affected with nail patella syndrome. So I think the simple test on a urine specimen can wait until a child is old enough to easily give a urine specimen to be able to pee into the cup. So one situation that's a little bit different from this general lack of having a really high risk of having kidney failure is during pregnancy. And nail patella syndrome has a very increased risk of a disease called preeclampsia that can occur in up to a third of patients with nail patella syndrome during pregnancy versus about 4% of patients in the general population. So the risk is much higher and that has to be taken into consideration. So if you're planning a pregnancy and you have nail patella syndrome, you need to make sure your obstetrician knows that you have it and they may want to refer you to a high-risk obstetrician. So at a minimum, usually if you have pregnancy with nail patella syndrome, your blood pressure and urine tests will be done more frequently than they would in patients who do not have nail patella syndrome. So what does it mean if you have involvement with your kidneys in nail patella syndrome? So again, remember, it's a fairly high percentage of patients that have blood or protein in the urine, but most people with nail patella syndrome will retain adequate kidney function throughout their lives not to require dialysis and transplantation. So it is something that you have to keep track of, but it's not something you're at terribly high risk for. So if your kidney function and your blood pressure is normal and you're an adult, you probably wouldn't even be sent by your internist uh, to see a kidney specialist. Uh, they tend to have a very high threshold before they send on. You do need to keep an eye on your blood pressure. That's not too hard to do, but it's very important in the general health and in your kidney health. And some people who have large amounts of proteinuria, meaning abnormal, not meaning ultra large, that stays with them would likely benefit from being treated with a class of drugs that are basically anti-blood pressure drugs called ACE inhibitors. So example would be lisinopril or enalapril um, that that is generally thought to be good for kidney diseases that have protein in the urine. It protects the kidneys. At this point, we don't have any specific treatment for kidney involvement in nail patella syndrome or any treatment for nail patella syndrome in general. So it's important to note that just having nail patella syndrome doesn't mean you're not going to get a kidney disease having nothing to do with it. So there are many things you can do that Adele referred to in terms of your general health. The two most common causes of kidney failure in the United States in adults are diabetes and hypertension. So any patient with nail patella syndrome should follow a healthy lifestyle to try to avoid these diseases. So no smoking, low salt, heart healthy diet, exercise, avoid obesity. So later in the series, uh, as with everybody else, I'll give a little more detailed talk that uh, goes into more of what we started on today. And I look forward uh, to speaking with you at that point. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, always very informative, appreciate that. Um, I did just put a message in the chat um, just for everybody generally. If you have questions later on that you would like to address to the individual doctors and you don't have their email address, you are welcome to email me. I put my email address in the comments um, and I can help facilitate that. Um, and that way um, it might be a little bit easier. Ian, do you think you're uh, ready to go?
Maybe not. Ian? There we, go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So let me try again. Okay. Hold on. Share screen. There we go. Is that showing? Are you seeing it? Yes, we can see it, yeah. Oh, sorry, right, okay. So there was an introduction from before. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the genetics of NPS and what the gene does. So as you've probably heard, NPS is inherited as what we call an autosomal dominant disorder. Um, that means that affected individuals have a 50% chance of passing the condition to each child. It means you have one working copy of the gene and one that isn't working. Importantly, in the families where there's NPS going around, um, a child who does not inherit NPS from their affected parent cannot pass it on to their children. As I said, NPS is the result of having one bad copy of the Alamex 1B gene. Um, you Ian, sorry to interrupt, but I don't see your slides advancing at all, and I think you may be advancing them. I just see genetics yeah. of NPS. That's it. Yeah, that's. There's nothing below that. Okay, just no, not. I don't see anything below that. No. Oh. So. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I could be there to fix it for you, but I can't. <laughs> um. It looks like you're it's caught between water. slides, says Ali, and that's indeed what it looks like. Sorry? It looks like you're caught between slides somehow. Like I see the bottom bit of your first slide and the top bit of your, your second slide. Oh, dear. It's a screen ratio, somebody is saying. I don't know if that okay. means anything to you. What are you seeing now, my title slide? I'm, I'm just seeing the bottom half of your title slide and the top half of your second slide. Oh, dear. Truth. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just talk. Okay. Yeah, you go ahead and talk. I think I think yeah, go right ahead. Um, so I'll come back up here, unshare my screen. Um, and I'll just put my notes up so I can remember what to talk about. Okay, so as I was saying, we inherit um one gene from mom and one gene from dad, and that applies to all genes, um, just as it does for LMX one B. So if one copy of lmx one b is not working, then there's not enough um, of a signal for, tissue, for cells to develop properly. Um, what lmx one b is doing is that it binds to, it's what we call a transcription factor. It directs the expression of other genes so that certain genes have to be switched on or switched off in certain cells at different times of development um, in order for the body to develop properly. And so if there's not enough LMX1B in the cell at that time of development, then um, the cell will not develop properly. Um, so when I was back at Hopkins years and years ago, we uh, were looking at the different changes that occur in the gene that cause Neopatella syndrome and overall there was 150 or some different mutations were identified. Um, in your families, there'll be very few of you who could go back in your family tree more than four or five generations and um, not see and still find Neopatella syndrome, sorry. So the mutations occur in DNA all the time. And it just so happens that if the, one of them occurs in elements on B, then we'll get what we call the sporadic cases or new cases where there's no family history. Um, there was a question I saw on the list about somebody saying that they were in the 10 or 15% who do not have mutations that are readily identifiable. What we know is occurring at least some of these situations is, um, that the whole gene has been lost rather than a specific change in the spelling of the instructions that the whole gene is missing. That doesn't make the Neopatella syndrome any more severe, 
um, it just makes it more difficult to identify in the routine testing. Um, there are also some instances where it's just that we don't know enough about how genes work to find every possible chain. Um, also, the particular mutation that might be identified in one copy of your LMX1B genes or one LMX1B gene is um, not determinant of your range of symptoms or the severity of the disease. Um, and you may have seen that also in some families where obviously everyone in the same family will have the same mutation in their DNA. And yet somebody may, in the family may have glaucoma, glaucoma another person will have um, kidney disease. So the particular elements on B mutation does not predict, predict the range or severity of symptoms. So elements one b is expressed early in development. Um, and um, if I was able to show you this picture, <laughs> it would show you where um, that is early in mouse development. So it defines the development of dorsal specific structures in the limb. And that's why your fingernails are affected. That's why the knee, um, the kneecap is affected because in embryologically that's a dorsal structure. Dorsal means back, sorry, um, ventral is front or underneath. So the back of your limb, these are dorsal structures. Um, so that's why your fingernails are affected. If you have what we call swan necking of your fingers, then that's because of the positioning of the tendons, either above and below and so forth. So the gene is required for the normal um, development of dorsal structures in the limb. We also see it uh, being required for proper development in the spinal cord. Um, and so that affects um, some of the uh, feeling you may have of not feeling temperature or pain in your fingertips is um, due to the um, way the nerves have developed there. Um, it's required for the normal development of the kidney, specifically, as Ke uh, Kevin was talking about, specifically um, cells called podocytes that are involved in the membrane differentiation and filtering in the kidney. Um, required for normal development of the eye. Um, as Sam was suggesting, um, it's expressed in what's called the periocular mesenchyme in the cell of the eye, and that the tissues like the sclera, the cornea, and then most importantly, the trabecular meshwork um, will not develop properly with um, the absence of sufficient amounts of LMX1B. Um, also, it's expressed in the brain during development for the development of certain types of neurons. And um, that is almost certainly related to why we see an increased risk of, or increased occurrence of attention deficit disorder, um, some forms of depression possibly in the patella syndrome. Um, and also, I, I saw a lot of questions about chronic fatigue syndrome. That may, but there's a lot of debate in some circles about what actually causes chronic fatigue. Um, it may be due to deficiency of serotonin or a problem with serotonin uh, in the blood. And again, that, that comes from neurons that again are, um, require elements on B to develop properly. So um, something along the lines of chronic fatigue syndrome could be a result of insufficient elements on B um, during development of the brain. Um, since I don't have my pictures, I, uh, I'll just summarize by saying, LMX1B is a transcription factor. It's um, during development, we can see that it is expressed in tissues that are affected by N in NPS. And NPS itself is the result of loss of function mutations in the LMX1B gene. So LMX1B is the name of the gene. It's also the name of the protein that the gene makes. Um, and as I said, it's a transcription factor that directs the development of specific tissues. So, sorry I couldn't get my slides to work. Hopefully, if we do this again sometime, I'll have it all fixed. No worries. Thank you, Ian. We appreciate that. 
I know your your topic is always hard when you don't have some pictures to go along with them, but you know, um, <laughs> next time around we'll 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 sort that out. All right, so our last speaker this morning will be Dr. Guzman, Susan, as we all know her, um, and she'll be presenting on um, uh, uh, NPS and the, the psychological aspect of it. So, and Susan knows what she's doing because she's done this before. So she's getting set up here. Um, for those of you who have put messages in chat, I, I'm probably not going to be able to read them all to later because there's an awful lot of them. Um, once Susan is through, try to go through some of our questions, but we're not going to be able to address them all. So we'll probably have to set up a separate thing to, to deal with some of the questions and answers. But this was what this was all about, to be a, a first step, a learning, a learning step to see how best to do this in future. So um, go ahead, Susan, you're on. All right, thank you. I, I like going last because I remember what it was like being at my first nail patel syndrome conference and how overwhelming that was. And um, that was before I offered to present on the psychological side of NPS. Um, I know that um, one of the values of being in person is we do our, we, a lot of what we like to do is, is do our show and tell where we'd be able to show off our thumbnails and that's how we greet each other and um, or our fingernails and, and how, how much extension we get in our elbows. And, and there's value in feeling like you're part of a community. I'm sorry that we we don't have some creative way to do a show and tell here because being part of a community is really important. So as, as we said in my introduction, I am a clinical psychologist. I specialize in health psychology and I, and I identify as a diabetes psychologist. So I, I do my full-time practice helping people with diabetes. And so it's always a big shift for me to start focusing on, on my own conditions. And it, and it is actually emotional for me when I hear your stories and relate to them. Um, so I am also an, a person with NPS. And this is uh, my dad who passed away two years ago. This is one of our last family gatherings. My dad had five children. My dad was a, a, a spontaneous mutation. My dad was spontaneous in a lot of ways, including his NPS. I was his first kid to have Nell Patel syndrome. So he didn't even know it was genetic until I was born. And then I wasn't diagnosed, or we as a family weren't diagnosed with Nell Patel syndrome until I was 12 years old. So my oldest brother, who's in the late colored shirt in the, up, uh, in the upper corner there, he's the only one of my dad's five children who didn't inherit Nell Patel syndrome. And, and then um, my brother Greg, sister Janelle, and my youngest sister Melanie have Nell Patel syndrome. And so not only am I a person with Nell Patel syndrome, was a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a mom. My, I have one son, Evan, and he has Nell Patel syndrome, and he's 25. And my sister Janelle's son, Oliver, also has Nell Patel syndrome. So our experiences with Nell Patel syndrome ranged from age 80 down to age five. So I thought it might be just to, to, and this is not based on research, this is based on my own family uh, experiences with Nell Patel syndrome and stories that I've heard from all of you. Um, some of you said it would be really nice to to have some um, new data to talk about and, be, and part of what makes living with Nell Patel syndrome hard is that there isn't a lot known about it. Research takes money, rare dis disorders don't um, pull for a lot of investment. And so it requires um, really generous people like uh, Dr. McIntosh and some of his colleagues to, to um, take an interest in Nell Patel syndrome. So what's hard about Nell Patel syndrome often is it, it involves having a rare disorder. So having a rare disorder, whether it's Nell Patel syndrome or something else, really involves navigating the world being different. And um, different, we can be different to those who don't have Nell Patel syndrome, or we can be um, different even in our own families, you know, for those of us who have big families with Nell Patel syndrome. Uh, my presentation is different than my siblings, my nephew Oliver is the first one in our family to have eye-related disease to Nell Patel syndrome. Um, my, my dad had uh, significant kidney disease and went on to uh, needing dialysis in the last year of his life. Um, I seem to be, have hit the genetic jackpot and, and got a lot of the stuff related to it. Um, frustrations of being a patient. I distinguish um, as a person with diabetes, I'm a person first. So there's, our role as a, a person with diabetes is different than, than our role as a patient when we have to navigate an already frustrating healthcare system. Um, having something rare means that 
very infrequently when we ever encounter a doctor who's had experience with male patella syndrome. That's what it's always cool when you hear Dr. Towers talk and that she actually has patients, plural, with male patella syndrome. Uh, social challenges that, that come from having a rare disorder, I mean, explaining to others. I hear a lot of people um, tell their stories about like they're not believed when they say that they have pain because you look fairly normal. And, um, and just having to explain what it means to have an patella syndrome can lead to a feeling of loneliness or isolation, especially for those of you who are the only one in your entire family that has an patella syndrome and you've never met another person with it. And on the psychological side, so I asked, I did a little survey of my family and said, if, you know, I have only a few minutes to talk about Napotella, what would you want to make sure that I mentioned? And they said, um, my son Evan said, for him, coping with uncertainty has been really hard. Um, uncertainty meaning like, like the first time that he went for a hike when he was on this senior field trip in New Zealand, he dislocated his knee for the first time. And he says, I never really know when some Napotella thing is is going to happen and it makes me a little afraid and so, so they're having skills for coping with that that things change with no patel syndrome and one day is different from the next um helplessness that you know a lot of times we can only do what we can about what we can control and a lot of times there's not a lot and that re results in feelings of helplessness um, body image issues are something that i when i have a breakout session i'll promise to talk more about but when you're, you know, when we have a culture that focuses so much on physical perfection, um, having muscles that don't develop right and arms that don't go straight or nails that don't develop um, can lead to body image issues. And it, um, some people end up uh, struggling with that. Um, and that's related to feeling of stigma, which is feeling like you're different in a negative way and feeling like uh, others see you as broken or defective. And then the social problems that can result from that. So people who feel stigmatized tend to anticipate rejection and um, start to avoid forming new relationships. Um, for a lot of us, it, it's learning strategies to live with both acute short-term pain and chronic pain. Um, I have both acute and chronic pain. Right now I'm dealing with a frozen shoulder um, that happened at the beginning of COVID. So it's been hard for me to get treatment for it. But I also have chronic pain in my knees and and in, in my tailbone area. Um, depression is something that's been, that, that we know that when you have a chronic health condition that you are, are at higher risk for, and there may be a, a, a biological component to that with Nelpatella syndrome, um, as well as um, ADHD. Um, in my family of the seven of us, five or six of us have ADHD. Um, that seems like it's a little high for the general population. So, you know, I do wonder if ADHD, especially in attentive type, is um, part of Nelpatella syndrome. And for, for my siblings with Nelpatella syndrome, in some ways, the ADHD has been one of the harder components um, in their lives. So just, I just want, don't want to just end with what's hard about Nelpatella syndrome, but to just a brief consideration of some strategies for living well to know that you're part of this big community. It's so cool to see people show up from all over the world. Um, that's a benefit of technology when it works is that we can get connected and get support. Um, I really challenge you to think about like what it means to be different, that um, be, be aware of your language that you label yourself with that marks you as um, broken or defective. Um, there can be a lot of power in difference and how the story that you tell yourself about that difference um, is, can really make the difference whether you struggle or whether you thrive with Nail Patel syndrome. There's some strategies for that too I would recommend for parents, but again, I, I promised to, that I'm willing to do a breakout session just talking to parents, especially um, for those who don't have Nail Patel syndrome. It's really important that you allow for tough feelings um, sometimes Nepotel syndrome really sucks, and um, we just don't want you to get stuck there. So to be able to acknowledge tough feelings without um, feeling like you need to minimize them, but also not getting stuck there. Um, developing assertiveness skills is so important for navigating our healthcare system when you have Nepotel syndrome. So learning how to advocate for yourself in a way that's respectful for the to the doctor and um, how do you bring up Nail Patella syndrome and how do you um, 
you know, demand a certain kind of quality of care. And, and perhaps when you have few choices, some of that is developing assertiveness skills and learning self-advocacy. And some and some of the people in in this group are very gifted at that and offer a lot a lot of um, helpful suggestions. And then I would offer as my last thing was to know when to get help and to have the courage to do so. Um, sometimes depression, body image issues, uh, social, social isolations or trauma from um, surgeries gone wrong or chronic pain. There's actually, uh, there's a lot of questions about chronic pain. There are some um, psychosocial interventions that have been shown to be as effective as uh, medication. Um, in particular, mindfulness-based stress reduction is a type of meditation. I had a patient who learned this skill and was actually able to have a root canal, which you can't imagine, um, without any pain medication. So get help um, and uh, don't feel like you have to suffer a certain length of time before you can get help. And now through, um, because of COVID, a lot of um, mental health professionals are moving their services online so that you, you know, even if you live in a more rural community, you can get help. And thanks for listening. That's my thumb. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. You always have such a great presentation and, and such a, a meaningful, impactful one. I think um, I, I think this is a great thing we've started here, and a great um, you know this is we're going to be able to build on this, and I think really be able to help people um, you know wherever they are. So um, as you can see, it's and here anyway, seven minutes past the hour, which means we have about 23 minutes left, which is not a whole lot if you see the number of questions I have in my document here that I've printed off. So obviously we're not gonna be able to get to all of the questions, even the ones that everyone submitted. So what we're going to do is we will, we're gonna just address a few of these and we will try to you know, have another session just to address more and maybe we'll just categorize them and, and, and do them that way, um, we'll do our best. So now my challenge is, is to try to pick out the best ones of these that might be most helpful for everybody. And I think a lot of them, um, a lot of them have to do with pain. And, and you know, any of the speakers who, who feel that they have something that they can contribute to this would be very helpful. But a lot of the speaker, a lot of the questions have to deal with chronic pain. And, and people have an issue, A, with trying to get their doctor to understand the level of pain that they have. Another one, other ones have questions about what are the best type of pain meds for me to use. And then thirdly, how do those pain meds impact my kidneys? So obviously, you know, Kevin would be the best one to deal, deal with that last question. But if somebody wants to start with the, the other questions, perhaps Adele would be a good one to start. Um, perhaps you can just um, uh, address those issues. Sure. Um, and pain in pediatrics as well. I just saw that question flash by my screen here. So sorry, go ahead. No, no problem. I don't think I can address the pediatric issue quite as well, but I certainly hear about the pain every day and all day, and it's very believable. I'll just share a brief anecdote. My, I sent my son to a pain specialist who didn't believe him, and then I had to send him to a second pain specialist who does believe him, and actually she prescribed him medical marijuana. So that's another option that we didn't discuss about here as well, and it the issue of pain control is very challenging because I can tell you what not to take, and that is the, the category of medications called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It, now, maybe once in a blue moon, they're okay. These are medications like ibuprofen, naproxen, Aleve, uh, things along that line. And Kevin, I know you'll chime in. Over time, they can cause damage to the kidney. Even Tylenol over time can have some damage, but Tylenol is infinitely safer than uh, the non-steroidals. The other things that people brought up in their questions was use of CBD. I have not seen any studies of CBD in nail patella, but I see plenty of studies where CBD helps with pain and topical CBD helps with pain. And then there's also a topical non-steroidal called Voltaren gel. Uh, that's often very helpful for people to rub on their knees or their feet or their elbows, wherever it hurts, if it's someplace that's accessible. So uh, again, a good slide would help to organize my comments, but uh, you want to avoid use of the oral non-steroidals. Tylenol is generally safer, but even over time, Tylenol and Kevin chime in about that on the kidneys can be have some impact. 
CBD certainly seems to be very, very safe. Notice I didn't talk about narcotics because I think that's a slippery slope. Uh, over time, your body becomes tolerant to narcotics and you would require more and more and more. So it's not one I typically uh, recommend for pain control. A good pain specialist who does acupuncture, injections, localized treatments, those really help. And when Steve Zaretsky gets on, is able, he can talk about uh, any of the surgeries for that. But that's usually, as a PCP, my last resort, uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, medical marijuana, if you Googled, I'd say 10 years ago, if you Googled Nail Patella, the first name you would bring up was the gentleman who was talking about medical marijuana. George McMahon, yes. Yeah, George McMahon, that's exactly right. <laughs> and it does work. It does do pain control. And in Pennsylvania, where I practice, I certify patients for medical marijuana. Uh, pain is a, a justifiable reason. So, so Adele, can you, can you address for just a quick second before we, we plug Kevin in here, what is the comparable to Tylenol in the UK and around the world? Is, is that paracetamol? I hear I a lot of discussion. I was just about to say that. Yes, okay. paracetamol. Okay. And, and, and do, do we know any NSAID brand names outside of the U.S. That, that maybe our U.K. and other country friends might be more familiar with? Maybe Kevin knows what those are, because I think many times on the listserv, there's those discussions. And, um, you know, I, I really don't know because I'm not from outside this country. But Kevin, we'll have you pipe in now because I'm sure you have a lot to say. So there are a number of NSAIDs and... Um, they may not be referred to that in your native language. Uh, so ibuprofen is one of the standard ones. Naproxen is another. Uh, uh, ketoprofen, there's, there's probably five to ten. Uh, so I think the main thing is if someone is getting these prescribed from their physician, their physician should know there are certain pain medicines that not people with nail patella syndrome, but people with any disease with decreased kidney function are going to be at higher risk for. NSAIDs are really good anti-inflammatories. It's just like narcotics are really good acute pain medicines. The problem is they have lots of side effects, and we do have other uh, approaches to pain, especially chronic pain, um, and I agree with everything Adele said. I think, you know, the basic thing is you need a pain specialist. Uh, those are the people that have it all. At my, our hospital, we have a whole section that does acupuncture. It's considered completely legitimate. So there are lots of different approaches, but you need someone for whom that is their field. Uh, because if you've got chronic pain, that's something you're going to be dealing with uh, for a while. And there are many effective uh, things that one can do that are not medicine-based that can be very supportive of if you do some medicine-based things. So basically, we tell all of our patients with any form of kidney disease, do not take NSAIDs without our permission, because in some circumstances, it might be appropriate, but we don't want people just grabbing them. Uh, acetaminophen also, in very high doses, uh, can cause liver damage, and uh, there is evidence that persistent use of it is uh, not good for your kidneys either. So. I, whenever one can go away from medication treatment for pain, I usually recommend it, even yeah. if acutely you may need it. I, I want to just em, e e echo that again to Dr. Lindley. I think that, you know, as a psychologist too, I, I'm, I'm encouraging people to learn ways to manage pain that don't involve more medication. And I, and I have to say, as a person with epithelial syndrome, one of the most effective things I've found are two, two things, exercise. I hate exercise, but it's one of the few things that have act, that's actually really helped my pain, um, especially when it comes to stretching. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when you have arthritis or something that feels like that, um, exercise actually pushing through the pain at the beginning of it can actually have big payoff. And because a lot of our muscles and tendons are tight, stretching exercises can actually really help with pain. Um, and then there's a, a lot of adaptive stuff. So um, uh, I have, I sit on a, a Cossack's pillow. So it's got like the little tailbone shape cut out and I call it my hiney pillow. 
I've tried about 20 of them and I finally found one that helps. I have a little back support thing that I, that I use and, I, and I've adjusted my lifestyle. So because I'm a psychologist, I sit to do my work, to talk to people. And unfortunately, I've had to change up my practice so that I can, I can only sit for about four hours. And um, so I can only see four, four people at, in, in a day and then I have to do something else. So, and, and I can't take because I do have kidney disease. So I'm very aware of all of that stuff, but also that uh, I can't emphasize enough that the certain type of meditation, mindfulness, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, super helpful, lots of research supporting it. And, and also I wanna say that depression is like an amplifier. So if you imagine there's a volume switch here that I can turn up, if you have depression, that's like an amplifier for pain. So pain and, and depression often in, and brain-wise go together. So when you have depression, it makes pain worse. So getting treatment for depression um, can also help with pain. Great, thank you, Susan. And and one thing I forgot, and I don't know if she's on the on the the call with us today, but there is a gal with NPS who's a physiotherapist. I know of two NPSers with, who are physiotherapists, and perhaps we can include her in a future session as well. That might help, you know, deal with some of the exercises, safe exercising, and and um, uh, exercises that would be helpful for us. Um, I'm going to just move along to a next question. I, I know we only have a chance for a few of them, but Ian, this is a question I get frequently from people is, is there any kind of NPS research going on right now? And, and are there any clinical trials going on? Is, I know Julia Hoover Fong was doing some things at Hopkins. Um, uh, is there any, any research going on at all that folks can be involved in? Um, no, I'm afraid not that I'm aware of. Um, so yeah, short answer, I'm afraid. Uh, not that I'm aware of. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, that's always, that's one of my burning questions too. And I had a follow up on the last question while I'm thinking about it. Kevin, for those of us who don't really have any kidney problems, okay. I mean, we have NPS, so obviously we're at risk for kidney problems. Um, our NSAIDs, you know, is there a problem if we use them for a period of time? And this is a very personal question because I'm actually using them now for a torn meniscus and I, which also happened just prior to COVID and haven't been able to get it treated yet. And just, I, I need to do something to help with the, the very uh, acute pain I'm having right now. Um, they are really good anti-inflammatories. So for the specific use you have for them, they may be the very best thing. I think the main thing is they don't become your chronic go-to everyday thing. I get gout and I'm very lucky that I get, it, it, it seems severe at the time but it's easy to treat. And like one or two days of ibuprofen in moderate dose and I'm good. So I, I take it, I usually just ignore pain, but gout's more like a disease and it's a treatment. But it, you're talking about a couple of days. Uh, keep hydrated if you're going to uh, take NSAIDs. Uh, but basically, I think they're okay even if someone has mildly decreased kidney function under some circumstances, but they just, should not be something you get exposed to overly often. So you need to get that meniscus taken care of, young lady. You know what? There are other Pretty ways to now. treat that, Joanne, uh, instead of using the ibuprofen and then instead of surgery. You don't even need surgery for that. Um, physical therapy. Yeah, well, well physical therapy. I, but there's also a product called PRP, and that's where, you, you know, I don't know if anybody else has heard of PRP. They take your blood, they spin it down, they give you the platelet, and that really helps to, and they inject it in your knee. It really helps to improve the inflammation and the trauma in the knee. It's, it's easier to well, do. Something than to consider. Yeah, something better than consider. the ibuprofen. If you've been taking it since March, I would be worried. Well, I haven't been taking it since March. I've been taking it on and off since March. So, um, anyway. All right. So, another question that there are free, a lot of is food. Um, issues with people um, who want to gain weight. How can they gain weight in a healthy manner? People who are eating higher protein diets, what's the safe amount of protein to be consuming, you know, in light of kidney issues? Um, what's the, the best, safest way to, to gain and maintain weight? Um, I'll just take care of the protein thing at the start. There is too much protein. Um, in particular, it's too much animal protein. 
which Americans tend to specialize in. Um, Plant-based proteins are in any number of respects much healthier for anybody, including patients with NPS. So I would say that at, even for young children, two to two and a half grams per kilogram per day is a max. That If you need more protein than that, you really need to be seeing a metabolic specialist. So um, I think three big max a day is probably not something anybody needs. Uh, tofu, uh, plant-based, actually is much less acid load on the body. So people who have decreased kidney function, they sometimes are afraid of plant-based foods because of the potassium. Uh, generally speaking, they tend to be safe and they tend to be much better and may even prevent progression of kidney failure by avoiding animal-based acid-rich foods. And you're speaking to a vegan here, so I am biased against animal products. But if you're if you're trying to gain weight, healthy fats, and you know olives, avocados. My favorite thing to tell people to snack, even people with diabetes and can, is nuts. If they need to gain weight, nuts are a very high source of fat and calories, but they're healthy for you. So that, that's what I would lean more towards. Certainly avoid processed foods. Avoid, you know, the white flowers and things like that. Those are not healthy uh, at all. But you but can. You're not going to gain weight in those muscle regions that didn't develop. So, yeah. you know, obesity isn't the answer to gaining weight. So. Right. But healthy. we had a gentleman. Do you remember Joanne who used to do rock climbing? He built yes. up his muscles really well. They just won't yes. build up the same way. Um, but it's but it's interesting too, and Dr. Towers and I have had this conversation in the past that there's there's kind of like two different categories of people with MPS. You know, there's some who really have struggled with gaining weight and maintaining weight, and then there's people like me who wish I could give you all some of my weight because I have extra to share. And um and there's there's very much two different categories of people, which um I think is interesting because sometimes on the on the Facebook pages, people will say, how do I gain weight? And I'm like, how do I lose weight? You know, it just seems like we're often talking against one another. <laughs> Ian might be able to comment on the different phenotypes that he may have noticed over the years because he's seen a lot of people with it. Yeah. Any yeah, thoughts? I'm not aware of anything that where that would be any less variable or more defined than um, whether you get kidney disease or glaucoma or anything else. So I think there's as much variation within a family on that as um, on anything else. So it's certainly not tied to the elements on B mutation as far no, as I'm aware. Sometimes we see different structures of people, but I don't want to take away from people. Yeah, yeah. Some people are tall yeah. and skinny and some people yeah. are- Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if everyone in the family is tall and skinny, then, and then you get NPS, then you're likely to be skinny. Um, if people in the family tend to put on weight, if they even look at food, then uh, you might not be quite so skinny even with NPS. So um, there's 22,000 other genes apart from LMX1B. <laughs> something yeah, there's else a lot I, more going on. <laughs> Go something ahead, else I want to make sure that, that, that we, we often hear about in conferences, and it certainly is an issue in my family, is not, is is um, a poor appetite, um, is yeah, really, really struggling with appetite. And I certainly, with my son, I feel like I've been, <clears throat> I was, he's 25 now, so he's, he's not my problem to force feed. But so the, the day he was born, I felt like I had to really force him to eat. And uh, I, and my mom reminded me that I was the same way when I was little. So, so it's not just sometimes that maybe we're of small stature, um, but also it may, it may be a, compounded by something else that causes um, poor appetite. And there may be some kind of feedback loop when there's not enough muscle mass that that feeds back to the brain and hunger. And so then it becomes this, 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 um, this feedback right. loop where it's hard to, hard to have an appetite to, to gain weight. So it's not right. bad to be thin, except if you have weaker bones and you have low muscle mass because you do need all of that. So that's where your exercise Tai Chi, et cetera, that in yoga in particular will help to build up that muscle mass that could potentially help to improve your appetite as well. I mean, certainly I think what we've seen with um, the expression of elements one b and its requirement for the development of the dopaminergic and serotonergic um, 
pathways in the brain could play into that. Um, but also, I think um, Susan's concern about uh, feeding in children, of course, if their appetite is really bad, then there's a risk of them not getting enough vitamins and so forth. Um, so that would be more important in children, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of discussion in the chat about lemon water. Maybe Kevin can address that. Yeah. I did uh, chime in because I saw it coming up over and over. And um, it's a little anecdotal, but my nephew was drinking lemon water and he got some really bad dental problems from it. It is a weak acid. So if it's around in your mouth, it is going to do what those bacteria acids do and cause caries. Um, it is a plant alkali. So the citric acid in it is a neutralizing thing for blood acid. So we actually use that in kids with kidney stones. So it's good in that sense, but I, I think maybe just eating vegetable, other vegetable sources and not sucking on a lemon might be a little better for your, your teeth. Or just water would be good for your kidneys, right? Uh, nobody drinks enough water. Yeah, um, Kevin always since... tells us all we're doing a bad job at that. Go ahead, Ian. Well, I, you just have to have a kidney stone once and you'll know you're not drinking enough water. Yes. <laughs> Been there, done that, yes. <laughs> um, just the mention of uh, teeth, and uh, I know I saw it in some of the questions as well. Um, Thank you. We heard over the years about uh, people with neopatella having very thin enamel or being told they had thin enamel and uh, you know, putting their dentist kids through college. Um, I'm afraid the research, other than what we see on by talking to patients, can't answer that because all of the other studies I've talked about where we think we understand roughly what LMH1B is do it, doing during the development will work out in mice. And mice have different teeth from humans, not only they have different shapes, but they only have one set. So tooth development is regulated differently and we have really no idea why or at least I have no idea why um, people with Neopatella syndrome should have weaker teeth. It could, uh, I just really just don't know. But, well, we had um, the dentists look at them back in 2002. Remember at the oh, conference? Oh, yes. We did have that. And they didn't really see any particular pattern from my recollection. Mm -hmm. But I will go back and look. I don't know if they ever published that either. So I have to go back and check. <laughs> right. Right, right. Well, very good. Well, I, I'm sad to say that our time is coming to a close. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to, to thank everybody, to thank our speakers, especially for taking the time out this morning to participate, but also everybody who joined in on the call. Um, you know, I think at the max, I saw 85 participants and that's, that's awesome. Um, I have put my email address in the chat. I put it in there a couple of times, so hopefully you don't have to scroll around too much. It's relatively near the bottom. Um, if you have any further questions for the docs that I can help to facilitate with, please do. If you have any comments or you have some special skill that maybe we could use to help make this work better in future, please let me know. I mean, one of the questions we got was, you know, how can we have a good database of physicians um, and, 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 you know, physiotherapists uh, who know something about nail patella syndrome? How can we start a database? If somebody can take on that project, Yay, let me know. Um, I, you know, I'm a very busy person. I have a very full-time job, so I just can't do everything. So I think we have to build this, this little village with everybody helping out. And so whatever you think you might be able to do, even something small, um, um, please let me know. And, and I think um, together we can educate more people, uh, keep our families healthier, um, do everything else. And we will have another Zoom meeting. I just see that question up there now. Um, James and I will probably, you know, confer after this and, and decide when we're going to do the next one. Hopefully, like on the third Saturday of the month, we'll try to make that a, a, a tradition. We'll coordinate with the doctors to see what Saturday they're available and, and do it from there. We'll try to get it out on all the Facebook groups to, to, to get, let everybody know. I think that's probably the easiest way for us to communicate with everyone. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that we got 85 people on here today, just with the, the, the couple of messages we put out was helpful. Encourage your friends, you know, the other people you know who have NPS who aren't on today, who you think might, might benefit from this. Um, I think it's a, um, you know, a great opportunity for us to, to help. Hopefully, James, once we end this call, all of the chat discussion is still there because I certainly have not read everything and I would like to. 
Um, so hopefully that will still stay active and we can, um, we can read through that later and see what other comments folks have made. But, you know, put a comment in the chat or send me a, an email, send me a message on Facebook, what have you. And um, hopefully we can take everybody's ideas together and, and, you know, make this work even better the next time around. All right. Thank you all. And I hope everybody has a good day and good night to those of you going to bed. <laughs> Thanks so thank much you, for joining Joanne, in. For, thank you, Joanne and James, for all the work you did. We appreciate uh, it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.